Okay, so thank you for joining us to this, uh, you know, uh, agricultural finances workshop that's going to be presented by Kevin Fort of the RBI. Uh, this program is made possible by the Southwest Indian Agricultural Association's 2020 Native American Agriculture Fund grant. Um, so we're happy to be able to have this event to help people out. And this event will be recorded and put onto uh, YouTube later on so that people can watch it. So Kevin, go ahead. Awesome. Thanks, Sophia. Everyone can hear me okay? All right. So uh, in the interest of keeping with the, uh, the finances fund theme, uh, I would like to let everyone know that we are going to be talking extensively about uh, tax and taxation today, as particularly as it relates to agriculture-based businesses. Um, given the nature of what we're going to discuss, I suspect that a lot of you are going to have questions, very pointed questions that are going to come up about your specific question or your specific operation. Uh, so what I would ask is if you can either keep a pencil and a piece of paper or a Word document open as we're going through, and if you have a question that comes up on something as we're discussing, please make note of that question, and you're more than welcome to send me an email uh, at the end of the presentation or anytime, um, and I'd be happy to answer that question, um, or you're also um, welcome to reach out back to uh, Sophia with Apex, um, and she can get a hold of me and forward those questions on. Um, but just want to make sure that as we go through anything that's specifically related to your operation, because we will be kind of deep diving into this. Um, so, all right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I can bring up the presentation. All right, is everyone able to see the, the presentation here? Yep, looks good. Awesome. Okay. So, and also, we would like to again thank um, the Southwest Indian Agriculture Association's 2020 Native American Agriculture Fund, as well as Apex Applied Technology, for making this presentation possible today. Um, so, what we are going to be covering today are essentially all of the topics that are within IRS Publication 225, the Farmer's Tax Guide. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, if you are currently running an ag business, and are looking for some interesting reading, I highly encourage you to review this. It is uh, a bit extensive, um, but it does give you some examples and some of the nuances that are applicable to agriculture-based businesses, particularly when you start getting into inventory-based questions um, and some of the other things that can result from uh, agriculture-based operations. Um, but here's, the, here's a list of the things that we're gonna cover. I won't cover those now. We'll get them to them as we get into the presentation. Uh, but this is what we're going to cover throughout the presentation. Let's go ahead and begin with the process of record keeping. So as with any business, um, agriculture or not, one of the first things that we want to look to establish early in the operations of that business is going to be a system of record keeping. Uh, ideally, uh, in a perfect world, we're going to start with um, developing an accounting manual. And that accounting manual is going to help guide us in the process of each of the factors that should be considered when we're looking at record keeping. I'm going to cover at the end of this presentation briefly what your accounting manual should contain uh, if you don't already have an accounting manual. Uh, and if you are looking for assistance with developing an accounting manual or have questions on what specifically should be in there, uh, certainly please reach out and I'm happy to answer those questions. Uh, for the types of records to keep, we want to make sure that we're keeping anything that pertains to income, expenses, payroll, inventory, assets, equity, depletion, depletion, anything that affects the business, uh, essentially. So anything that can have an economic impact on the business or any transaction that is originating from or uh, occurring to the business, we want to try and find a way to keep uh, records of those transactions in some form of an organized and recallable manner. So that way, in the event of an audit, or if it's something as simple as management just wanting to know, hey, why did we make this decision? Or what was the impact of that decision that we made? Um, you're able to recall not only the, uh, the results of the transaction, but also, also the records that uh, started moving you down the process of making those decisions. Uh, I also want to point out that any uh, corporations, if you're a registered corporation, um, this is uh, beyond an LLC. Uh, so if you are specifically um, registered with the state as a corporation, uh, or if you have a multi-member LLC, I recommend uh, that you keep copies of your meeting minutes 
uh, with your board of directors. It is not required for multi-member LLCs. It is required for corporations according to the IRS. But if you do have a multi-member LLC, I do recommend uh, just for protection purposes, keeping copies of those minutes. As far as how long your records should be kept, um, it really does depend on the specific document or the specific record where they're talking about. Um, the IRS does highlight and outline the statute of limitations uh, for each specific thing if you really want to go through them. Uh, for example, your tax returns have a three-year statute of limitation or two years from the time that you've paid the tax. Uh, so there's nuances that are applicable there. Any employment records for relating to employment taxes have a four-year statute. In general, my recommendation to my clients is that uh, seven years is the minimum that you keep. Um, because once the seven years rule, the statute of limitations is no longer applicable. However, there are benefits and reasons that you would want to find a way to keep those records, uh, especially if you can do it in a economically uh, uh, conscious fashion, such as electronic record keeping. Uh, with, with modern accounting systems, what, what uh, you see here on the screen, the examples are a screenshot from Xero, which is an accounting-based system that I use for many of my clients. Uh, QuickBooks is another one, um, and there are a few other small bench um, and Greenwise, a few of the smaller ones that are out there. Most of these uh, online or digital accounting platforms, they have some way of attaching your documentation within the transaction itself. So when you record a new bill uh, or new, a new source of income or new revenue coming into the business, usually there's going to be an option to attach a copy of the receipt or the invoice or whatever the applicable documentation is to that transaction. Uh, this is probably one of the best and least expensive ways to maintain that documentation and keep it organized, uh, readily available for auditors if you were ever to be audited, um, which if you're paying attention to recent legislation, um, there's a high probability that increased audits are going to occur. Um, what you can do with these types of accounting platforms is essentially uh, create an account for the auditor. Uh, give them access to it and turn them over and just say, I've got, uh, I've got a business I've got to manage. You'll find access to everything you have questions on within, within this accounting platform. Let them do what they need to do. You'll obviously have visual uh, over their, um, what they're doing and reviewing within the accounting system. If you really need to know, they won't be able to manipulate the records, but it's one of the easiest ways to get through an audit, uh, have the applicable documentation that you need. Uh, record the transactions in a efficient and organized manner and have all that readily available. Not to mention if there's a fire, loss, weather, whatever might occur, um, all of the records are maintained digitally. And if you use companies like QuickBooks or uh, Xero, their insurance covers loss of records, um, which is not something generally that I worry about, honestly. Um, Xero itself uh, maintains four different servers globally, one in New Zealand, one on the European continent, one in the North America continent, one on the Asian continent. Um, so, and I know that the records for my clients are maintained each on those, those different servers on those different continents. So any one critical failure is not gonna cause a major loss of data. Um, so the, there's a lot of things to consider and given the cost of these types of platforms, uh, you can run a basic uh, accounting subscription package for around 13 bucks a month with zero. I think it's 15 bucks for uh, QuickBooks. Uh, so it's really cost efficient and it's a really fantastic way of maintaining your records. Does anybody have any questions on specifically the record keeping aspect before we move into uh, the other elements within this presentation? Okay. Once we've established and identified how we want to keep records, whether that's going to be physical records in a filing cabinet or digitally electronically, the next decision that we need to make is how we're going to manage our books. And we call this the accounting method. From an accounting method perspective, we typically have two basis of accounting that we're considering. But with agriculture businesses, things can get a little more complex. So there is a third, in, um, a third category that we do need to take into consideration. On an accrual basis of accounting, what this is essentially meaning is that we are going to report income in the year that it was earned. Uh, and the expenses in the year that they are incurred. The easiest way to decipher between the accrual and the cash basis and really what the, the differences are is on the cash basis of accounting, we are looking at when the money actually exchanges hands. Whereas with the accrual basis, um, we look at when 
the economic transaction occurred. So if you on a handshake and a verbal agreement with a supplier agreed to purchase, uh, let's say livestock feed, technically once you've made that verbal agreement and the handshake, there has been an economic transaction that has occurred under the accrual basis of accounting and the accountant should record the transaction at that time. If you're on the cash basis of an accounting, it doesn't, uh, the accountant doesn't necessarily concern themselves with the handshake and the agreement. It's more once the grain or the feed is delivered and you've uh, physically paid for or cash has been moved in exchange for that feed, that's when the transaction would be uh, recorded. The reason this is important is because it can have ramifications for when you recognize revenue uh, and when the deductions occur. So the reason for using an accrual basis, the intent is to kind of match income with expenses to the correct year. So if you have uh, you know, expenses that are occurring towards the end of your accounting year, uh, but you're not gonna actually realize any economic impact until the next year, the accrual basis of accounting looks to reconcile that and make sure that our income and our revenue are recognized in the same tax year. Whereas on the cash basis, we lose that ability um, because we look to actually record when the, the transaction occurs with the cash basis. Um, between the two, uh, generally speaking, any businesses that are not corporations and generally under the 5 million annual mark, my recommendation for my clients is that we're going to assume a cash basis of accounting. It simplifies everything. It's a lot less expensive to maintain. Um, and until we move over that 5 million uh, gross revenue annually, uh, there's very little benefit to going to a cruel basis. However, I do like to add a caveat in that uh, any business operating really stands to benefit from maintaining both an accrual and a cash basis. Um, and the previous slide when I was talking about the digital accounting uh, platforms like Xero or QuickBooks, one of the main benefits for management is the ability to quickly and easily toggle. There's a, there's a literal toggle switch between cash and accrual basis. And so what that does is it gives management the ability to look and see based on a forecast with uh, the accrual basis, accrual gives us a much more accurate forecasting abilities than the cash basis will. But from a managerial standpoint, the ability to toggle between the two has a lot of benefit for planning and execution. Um, beyond that, uh, most businesses, as I stated below the 5 million annual revenue, um, and not structured as a corporation, uh, the cash basis is the simplest, easiest, and that's what you're going to use. The, the third option of the third category we discussed is specifically related to farm inventory. And this is special circumstances where farm inventory, particularly if we're looking at those types of agriculture businesses that use multi-year crops, uh, such as vineyards, um, asparagus growers and those, those such that have uh, a long lead out time before production or multi-year pre-production. Um, the, there's, there's special categories within the accounting methods that allow us to use a farm-based inventory method to make sure that we're properly recording the costs and the revenues associated with those crops appropriately within uh, the business. That way you're not getting a high tax bill um, in years that you don't have revenue because your crop is in pre-production. Are there any questions on the accounting method? I'm, I'm sure there will be if there aren't at this immediate moment. All right, so once we've just determined our uh, basis of accounting, the next thing we're gonna do is we need to start looking at how do we, how do we start to account for revenue and expenses. With income specifically, there's two primary considerations we need to look at. The first is, is the income taxable? How do we know if income is taxable? Well, taxation is different based on different sources of revenue. And the reason that record keeping is so important is that it allows us to classify different categories of revenue so that when it comes time for tax season uh, or tax filing, we're able to quickly decipher which sources of revenue are taxable and which aren't. Um, it also helps us look for special circumstances, uh, as I've highlighted here, sales of farm products um, or cost sharing, product sharing, sales related to weather. So if, uh, if there's a year of drought or maybe another weather related circumstances that causes you to um, drastically reduce inventory on the farm uh, to prevent a, a loss due to weather, 
Um, that's a special category that we need to make sure we capture, and that's going to fall under different taxation rules than general farm revenue. Government payments, uh, insurance disaster payments, any of those special one type deals, we specifically need to have an account set up in our chart of accounts to record those types of income separate from your normal operations income because they are treated differently for tax purposes. Um, and it's going to be a lower tax bracket for those specifically. So I'd hate for you to pay more taxes than what you're re required to pay on that. Secondly, we also need to evaluate in this specific area uh, as to whether the income is taxable is how does off-farm uh, income impact that? And I'm not talking about uh, if you have a W-2 job off-farm, that's gonna be a completely different situation. But what I'm talking about is if you have an agreement with a neighbor, um, perhaps you know they do a custom hire because you have a, heavy, a piece of heavy equipment that they could benefit from, they want you to come dig a pond or something of that nature. And they hire you to come do that work that income that you would normally have to report does fall under different taxation rules. So we need to be able to classify that income separately. All of this should be done within your chart of accounts. And I'll briefly explain that as we get uh, deeper into the presentation, how the chart of accounts and that works within your accounting manual. Uh, but for the, for the time being, I just want you, these are general considerations that you need to be thinking about as you go into the process of record keeping and setting up the business, tracking and monitoring income. The second main consideration is when is the income taxable? So revenue recognition for those who are grossly involved with the International Accounting Standards Board and the Financial Accounting Standards Board will undoubtedly know that there has been a six decade argument uh, or developing argument relating to revenue recognition. It is a highly complex topic within the world of accounting um, and it is very op open to uh, interpretation. However, there are rules that are followed um, and it generally relates back to our cash versus basis of accounting. So um, when you're selecting that cash versus accrual uh, scenario for your specific business, there are specific questions that you need to be asking relating to revenue re recognition and how recognizing that revenue will impact your tax basis uh, for the farm. When it comes to expenses, um, it's kind of necessary that we start down the process of identifying what is an or, uh, ordinary and necessary cost versus a capital expense, uh, and how do, we, how do we record those expenses? Um, so the first thing we need to do is make sure we understand appropriately what an ordinary and necessary expense means um, if we're looking at is the expense deductible, right? So the first two measures that the IRS is going to be looking at to determine whether it's a deductible expense for the farm is, is it ordinary, meaning what most farmers do? And is it necessary, meaning is it something that's useful and helpful in, in the uh, industry of farming? Some expenses that you're gonna pay throughout the, the year, tax year, might be partial, but uh, partly divided or allocated between personal and business. This is very common within uh, agriculture-based businesses because typically the farmhouse is used to help manage the business and run aspects uh, of administration while you know the, the outside areas are used to actually produce uh, agriculture products and or process package uh, and prepare pro products for distribution. Uh, what we need to make sure of when we are uh, looking at setting up our books for record keeping is having a proper allocation uh, or basis for what, what percentage of a particular asset is used for personal and what percentage is used for business. And that needs to be consistent. So again, this is another area within your accounting manual. I highly recommend that we've consistently addressed. Okay, so for the office, uh, we've allocated that because it's the office, 70% is allocated to business, 30% is for personal use. That's documented within your accounting manual. So in the event of an audit, you can demonstrate to the auditor, we consistently apply this rule based on you know, our predetermined process for allocation. The kitchen, you know, the kitchen we only use you know, 40% for processing packaging, uh, or if you have a separate kitchen, great. But I think you get the point of any, any area where you have a combination of personal and business uh, mix of use, there needs to be a proper allocation and it needs to be consistently used and documented within your accounting manual to, to help make sure that you're consistent with that application. If you use the cash method of accounting uh, to report your income and expenses, um, the deduction for prepaid farm supplies in the year that you pay them is limited to 50% of your deductible overall expenses. So 
It's important specifically when you're looking at farm-based supplies uh, and feed supplies. There are limitations on what you can include in your deductible expenses, and they're usually going to be a fraction. In this case, your prepaid farm supplies are going to be 50 percent. Uh, feed supplies are typically 25 percent of total farm expenses, um, and there's a few other rules that are applicable in there. Just make sure before you go down the road of paying for those prepaid supplies that you understand the tax limitations of that purchase. There, there may very well be, and in some cases, there's a requirement for there to be a business use uh, or a business requirement for occurring that prepaid farm expense. Um, but just make sure that you understand the tax ramifications of that decision. Uh, specifically here with prepaid livestock feed, for those that it's applicable to, I wanted to highlight that if you report your income and expenses under the cash method, you cannot deduct in the year that you paid the cost of any feed that you do not use or consume within that year. So that is something to keep in mind. If you set up your business on the cash basis of accounting and you intend to, to prepay for your livestock feed, understand that you will only be able to write off or deduct the cost of that fee that is consumed within that tax year. This is not necessarily a bad thing, so I don't want to scare anyone off or um, make you feel like this is a necessarily a negative. What this can do is allow you to spread that cost across uh, essentially the duration of the use of the feed um, and help reduce your tax liability in future years. Um, however, there is strategy to be had here. Uh, so specifically looking at your specific situation and working with a CPA or tax accountant that understands agriculture uh, before you make the decision to go down the road of prepaid farm supplies or livestock feed is probably going to be in your best interest to make sure you understand the different scenarios that can play out and how that's going to impact you monetarily. Um, these following tests or the three tests you see here are specifically what an IRS auditor would look for in determining whether you appropriately deducted that livestock feed. Um, and I've given some general rules here to help you understand how applying these tests uh, work or if they don't apply, then what, what's ultimately going to happen. Labor hired, this is a big one. Um, a lot of people have questions about the difference between a W-2 worker, 1099 worker, uh, who's responsible for uh, different employment taxes. Uh, so I've addressed some of that here. Generally, you can deduct reasonable wages paid for farm labor if the labor comes from your farm. Um, specifically, excuse me, what that's going to mean is that you have gone through the process of hiring somebody through a W-2 worker. You control their labor, you control their hours, you direct essentially every aspect of that, you know, that person's labor. That means that you have met the standards for an uh, employer an employer-employee relationship and are paying wages appropriately, paying taxes, including the employer portion of those taxes. Um, if that is true and correct, then there are expenses that you can deduct within uh, each tax year. Uh, expenses or, or wages can be paid in both cash or non-cash items, such as inventory capital assets, uh, inventory products, things of that nature. Um, and you would wanna have that addressed within your accounting man manual uh, as to how you handle that. Um, especially if you are thinking about setting up to where you're kind of doing exchange of uh, food products or, or farm-based products in exchange for labor and those types of things. Uh, the cost of boarding for farm labor is a deductible labor cost, um, and that's something that should be very uh, intentionally handled. Other deductible costs can incur uh, or that you incur uh, include health insurance, workers' comp, and other benefits. Some of the nuances, um, sorry. There was one more slide I thought I had here. Okay. Uh, repairs and maintenance costs for the farm itself. Uh, you can deduct most expenses for R&M. Um, common repair items are repainting ceiling cracks, those types of things, maintaining the vehicles or the heavy equipment. Uh, the main thing I wanted to do with this slide is make sure I point out the IRS designated difference between a repair and maintenance versus a capital expenditure. So in the bottom here, I've included two bullet points that should help clarify. Um, if, if you're looking at just replacing a few shingles on a roof, on a barn roof or something, that's generally considered an R&M cost, uh, and that would be immediately deductible. If, however, you're going to be replacing the entire roof, that would be considered a capital expenditure. Uh, we're going to do a cost basis on the replacement of the roof. That's going to be recorded as a liability, and then it would be deducted 
uh, through depreciation over um, what makers would allow typically a five-year capital expenditure um, deduction on that. So there's just a different way of handling. Uh, if you have questions as before you move down the road of repairing or, or making an investment to repair or improve your farm or different property on the farm, uh, as to whether that's an R&M expense or a capital expenditure, please reach out to a CPA, tax advisor, someone who understands the difference between the two. Here's another or a list that I included of uh, common uh, expenses within agriculture industry. This is by all means not an extensive list, but just to give you an idea of the different expenses that are typically occurring within an agriculture business. And you're going to want to make sure you set up your chart of accounts appropriately to, to book and recognize these expenses and then also subsequently be able to track uh, or track at the end of the year uh, what, what expenses are tax deductible and which aren't. To specifically address capital expenditures, um, they are generally not deductible, but they may be depreciable. The difference uh, is whether you can immediately reduce the expense from your income earned in that year or whether you have to depreciate the, the capital expenditure over a predetermined life of that asset. So the IRS for essentially every asset you can think of has a table that determines what the, the usable or depreciable life of that asset is. And if it is considered a capital expenditure, we would use that table to essentially assign a useful life of that. And then we're gonna reduce the cost or your tax, your tax basis based on that depreciable portion of the asset over the life of the asset. A capital expense is payment or debt incurred, uh, depending upon how expensive the asset is. For the acquisition, production, or improvement of property, um, you include the expense in the basis of the asset. So essentially all that means is rather than reporting on the income statement, the expense under a normal circumstance, like if I bought a box of pens for my business, that would typically record it on the income statement under office supplies. Uh, however, if I purchased a machine to manufacture pens, um, that is a completely different situation. I now have a capital expenditure that I would record the, the cost of the machine on my balance sheet. And then over the life of the asset, I would depreciate that uh, through depreciation. Um, and I've included some examples here as to what typical capital expenditures are. Soil water conservation expenses. This is a big one and I suspect that it's not used or taken advantage of as much as, that, as it can be. Um, if you are in the business of farming, you can choose to deduct certain expenses for soil water conservation, prevention of erosion, and um, protection of endangered species. Uh, I think this is an incredibly awesome thing to take advantage of. It does limit um, the expenses, the deductible expenses to 25% of the gross revenue uh, for that year, but a quarter percent is, is uh, significant and can certainly be significant for uh, many of the smaller producers. Um, one caveat with the soil and water conservation aspect is you do have to have a plan approved by the NRCS. Um, and I think especially the, the AgVets folks, um, but not to be um, isolating, anyone, anyone is certainly welcome to reach out and we'd be more than happy to help connect you with NRCS for the state of Arizona and work with you to get this plan in place so that you can take advantage of this awesome opportunity to not only protect our environmental resources, but also protect the economic resources of your business. And um, this should be included in your accounting manual as well, in my opinion. Basis of assets. So essentially what we're meaning by the basis of assets or in, in simple terms, we're looking at what is the cost of the asset? That's what the IRS wants to know. Um, because, because tax law does allow us to reduce and or depreciate uh, for the cost of the business, um, those assets, the IRS wants to establish that basis of assets. And so this needs to be recorded within our accounting, uh, our accounting manual, as well as within our accounts themselves. So typically when you record an asset, that's going to be the basis of the asset for most purposes, um, although it can be different under certain circumstances. Um, but then as throughout the life of that asset, if we make improvements to that asset, we can record transactions that will increase the value of that asset the, thereby increases the basis of that asset and thereby changes our depreciation schedule or the way that we're gonna depreciate that asset. Similarly, if we take a reduction of value, uh, let's say that um, a farm building is damaged 
and um, for that, at least for the foreseeable tax year, you don't anticipate making any improvements to that building. Uh, the insurance adjuster's claim against the building can be used to decrease the basis of that asset and thereby take a tax deduction on those assets so that you're not paying a tax on an asset that doesn't provide value to the business. Um, and then at a later time, if you do end up making improvements, again, you would adjust the basis of that asset based on the increased value or the benefit that you're providing to the, to the asset. Uh, so this is just a simple terminate or terminology. I want to make sure you understand that when you're looking at purchasing assets, whether it's property, uh, equipment, uh, things of uh, value to the business, to understand how you can uh, impact the value of that, that asset. Depreciation, depletion, and amortization. These are three uh, terms that you should be familiar with. Depreciation, we've, we've talked extensively. Essentially, it is the way of reducing or assigning cost over the life of the asset uh, in a manner that we reduce the value of that asset from a tax perspective. Depletion uh, is, in the world of agriculture, the using up of natural resources in mining, quarrying, drilling uh, type of environments or, or operations. Uh, the, de the depletion deduction allows for those types of businesses to essentially take into consideration the amount of mineral or usable mineral that has been consumed and depreciate that from their revenue base. Amortization is a method of recovering or deducting certain capital costs fixed or uh, over a fixed period of time. So amortiz amortizable costs include startup costs of going into business, which um, just for those who are curious is gonna be capped at $5,000 for a startup business uh, in the first year of operations. Reforestation costs and the cost of pollution control facilities, those types of things uh, are all amortizable. Your 197 intangibles uh, for anyone who is going down the road of licenses, patents, uh, trademarks, uh, setting up franchise, those types of things are considered 197 intangibles. And we would definitely want, if that is your case, to make sure you're working with a CPA or a tax advisor who is well-versed in amortization of 197 intangibles. Because um, that's going to also require the attorneys to be involved to make sure that everything's properly protected. Gains and losses, something we deal with every year. Hopefully we're dealing with gains more than we're dealing with losses, but they both occur. Um, if you sell, exchange, or otherwise dispose of property, whether it be an asset or a liability, and in the terms of accounting, it's an asset if you own it outright and clear, and it's something that is used to generate revenue. It's a liability if it's something that is not owned outright, meaning you have a mortgage or a note or some type of a promise to pay against that liability, and it is not something that is generating revenue actively. Um, in either scenario, we need to account for the gains and losses that are associated with those assets. And we need to be able to use those uh, in a determination to understand whether that's going to result in a tax liability. The sale or transfer of money or mortgage, um, sorry, uh, to, uh, or a promise to pay money is typically what's going to result or that's the official start of a transaction uh, that is going to result in a gain or a loss. Uh, also, an exchange of property for similar or like properties can also uh, trigger a gain or a loss, or at least a transaction that the IRS is going to want to know whether a gain or loss occurred. Uh, property sold or exchange may include the sale of a portion of a maker's asset. Essentially, all this is saying is um, you may have an asset, let's say a tractor that you've already had on a depreciation schedule uh, because you were deducting that cost. And so there are special rules for handling um, an asset that is already on a depreciation schedule, essentially we're not going to look at any of the depreciation for that asset in terms of a gain or a loss, capital, capital gain or loss, once that item is sold or exchanged. Uh, it would only be the undepreciated portion of that asset that would be applicable to a capital gains uh, or loss uh, tax scenario. The difference being, uh, forgive me, I'm in South Florida and it's really hot, so. Uh, the difference being is that ordinary uh, transactions are typically taxed at a higher rate than capital gains. And so this is why it's important when we're looking at how the different tax brackets are going to impact a different transaction. You're going to want to understand if I sold this asset and immediately recorded the income or the revenue uh, to the income statement and that fell under ordinary uh, income taxation rules, you're going to pay a higher tax rate on that income 
rather than if it's a capital asset that you sold um, and then properly booking that to a capital gains, uh, which would result in a lower tax liability for you and the business. Like kind exchanges, uh, essentially all that's meaning is um, exchanging one kind of property for one that is the IRS would consider it uh, like, then there is typically not a taxable event um, and that's considered a non-taxable exchange. Uh, to qualify for that, it has to be a qualifying property under IRS definition and a like kind property. Both of those I highly recommend that you work with a CPA or a tax advisor that understands IRS regulation pertaining to those types of uh, definitions. This positions a property used in farming. This is definitely something that will occur uh, if you're going into farming at some point. There will be a piece of equipment or an asset that just no longer maintains value for you, uh, or you just realize that there could be a, a benefit for selling it. When you dispose of any property that's used in your farm business, a taxable gain or loss may have occurred. Um, and so if you're going to report the sale of that item, then as we've already discussed in the gains and losses section, you need to understand the ramifications of how that's going to work. You need to understand uh, the depreciation schedule and what the life cycle of that depreciation schedule is for that particular asset um, and make your, your managerial decisions from that perspective. Uh, as I previously stated, ordinary income is taxed at the same rate as wages and interest, which is a higher rate. Um, usually 18 to 22%, depending upon the tax bracket for the business. And capital gains is generally taxed at lower rates. When you dispose of depreciable property at a gain, uh, you may have to recognize part of the gain as ordinary income under the depreciation recapture rules. Basically what this is stating is what I just stated. If you have an asset that's already under a depreciation schedule, whatever portion of that asset that has been depreciated is going to be taxed as ordinary income. The undepreciated portion of that asset can go under uh, capital gains, which is taxed at a lower rate. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Installment sales, particularly uh, this applies to anyone who has the sale of property. If it's going to uh, cross over from one tax year into another, then you're technically coming into what the IRS classifies as an installment sale. And you're gonna to want to make sure that you're working with a CPA or a qualified tax advisor to understand how to properly assign the cost to which tax year uh, so that you're making sure that you're paying the least amount of tax as possible. Um, but that's, that's an installment sale um, and it particularly applies to anything that's gonna cross over multiple tax years. Casualties, thefts, and condemnations. Um, casualties occur when property is damaged, destroyed, or lost due to a sudden unexpected event. A theft occurs when property is stolen. Condemnation, I'm gonna foot stomp this for anyone who currently owns uh, private property that is in agricultural production. Please pay very special close attention to your constitutional rights with regards to condemnation. However, understand that there are laws out there that allow uh, the government uh, to take legally owned private land for public use. And if that is the case, if that ever does become your case, then there are ramifications tax wise, uh, or hopefully more appropriately stated, there are tax benefits for you to uh, ensure that we file a claim under the condemnation of loss of that asset. Um, and there's other damages that would be a result of that. But um, these, these three types of things you need to be aware, they do occur obviously, um, and there are tax implications for each of these different situations. So understanding the situation itself and how that tax uh, should be handled based on that situation is something that you wanna be familiar with. Self-employment tax. This is important to you if you are earning your income off of the business um, and you don't have any other sources of income. It's, it's important regardless, but particularly if you don't have an off-farm income, uh, if you're not a W-2 employee somewhere else, um, and if getting your credits for Social Security are important to you, then as a farm worker, you want to make sure that you're properly filing your self-employment tax, uh, because that's going to ensure that you are receiving credit for uh, the work that you're producing uh, and the tax that you're paying to be eligible to draw Social Security benefits down the road. Um, that's what I've explained here. The self-employment tax rate is 15.3% as of right now. Uh, that rate consists of 12.4% for Social Security and 2.9% for Medicare. Self-employment tax is for you, specifically the business owner, and is different from employer taxes or employment taxes. If you have staff 
uh, that uh, assist you on farm and they are W-2 employees, then that would be separate from your employment taxes or your self-employed taxes. Um, in general, you're an employer of farm workers if your staff meet any of these um, following conditions that are bulleted below. Specifically, I wanted to address um, common, I think, scenarios that occur within small production facilities or operations, um, and that's the use of family members for, um, for labor. Make sure that if you have questions about what you're paying or how you're paying uh, children, spouses, or partners, um, if they're associated with the business, as to whether you're going to actually W-2 them and bring them on as a legal employee or whether you're going to pay them otherwise. Uh, make sure that you're speaking with a CPA or tax advisor who understands the ramifications and can advise you appropriately on that. I understand that that's a question that a lot of people have. Um, one, one thing that uh, larger producers need to be aware of if you're going to be bringing in crew leaders, um, if the crew leader is responsible for directing the activities and they bring in their own team, um, they may very well be liable for the employer's portion of the taxes themselves. It's really gonna depend on your agreement with that crew leader and what their responsibilities are. Um, and that's gonna come down to a contractual basis. So make sure again, uh, if you are using a crew leader to direct farm labor, um, that you understand the nuances of who's responsible for the safety of those employees, the taxes of those employees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all cash wages you pay to an employee during the year uh, for farm work are subject to Social Security Medicare taxes, including uh, federal taxes, FUDA, state taxes, SUDA. Um, with modern, again, modern technology, paying farm payroll is quite simplified when you use um, payroll companies that manage this. They do it for a very reasonable fee, in my opinion. Um, they handle all of the filings for your 940s and your 941s, which are your quarterly and annual uh, Social Security and Medicare uh, tax reports that are required to be filed. Um, so just, just simplify it, uh, make sure those things are handled uh, appropriately. Or if you have questions, make sure you're working with your CPA or your tax advisor to uh, file the appropriate reports and pay your taxes on time so you don't incur penalty. If the cash wages you pay to farm workers are subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes, they are also subject to federal income tax holding. Fuel and excise tax uh, credits and refunds. This is gonna be a big topic this year for a lot of agriculture producers. Uh, you may be eligible to claim a credit on your income tax return for um, federal excise and certain fuels. Um, you may be eligible to claim a quarterly refund for taxes used during the year rather than waiting till the end of the year. Um, if you're operating an operation that is intensive on fuel use and those expenses are high, uh, this may be a very good way for you to help recover some of those costs on a quarterly basis and uh, not eat into your cash flow to uh, that would otherwise inhibit your operations throughout the year. So make sure you're working with your CPA or your tax advisor to understand uh, that quarterly refund process if you are a fuel intensive business. Um, there's a few other nuances here. I'll let you read on those. Um, but make sure that you understand that the non-taxable uses for fuel for a farm have to meet these three criteria here. They must be used on the farm for farming purposes. Um, they must be, or they can be for off highway business use and they need to be for uses other than as a propulsion engine uh, in home use. I threw this table in here to kind of help clarify. I felt like this really helped simplify what fuels are eligible for the credit or the refund or both and which are not and in what scenarios and circumstances. You'll also find this table in IRS publication 225. The heart of the matter, policies, procedures, and the accounting manual. I know that this is not a fun part of the business. Nobody wants to sit down and write out a 110 page accounting manual that's gonna dictate how we're going to handle receipts and uh, which basis of accounting that we're going to use. But if I may, those businesses uh, from my experience that have maintained a proper accounting manual have not only found that their operations are much more simplified, especially if they're looking to grow and hire staff to help them run and manage the administrative aspects of the business so that they can free themselves up to do other things, uh, whether that's grow the business, go on vacation, whatever it might be, having that accounting manual in place really helps uh, ease the onboarding process and training new staff. And in the event of an, I, an audit, 
uh, it is going to do wonders for you in showing the auditor that you understand what you're doing uh, and that you're not trying to get away with things that uh, the auditor might be concerned with. So specifically within the accounting manual, there's the policies, the procedures, the, po the policies are the rules that we put in place. Uh, these are organizational rules that are put in place to help establish the guidelines for how we're gonna handle different situations. So that's going to um, specifically discuss the, the purpose of the policy, the scope and the definition so that anyone who's reading that can clearly understand. Some examples, um, the chart of accounts for those, uh, for those that are my clients, they'll know that the chart of accounts, that's the foundation of the accounting process. And I'm very, very protective over the chart of accounts, primarily because the chart of accounts are going to establish everything from the beginning. Um, and it's also gonna be how we determine how consistent and concise the recording of those transactions are going forward. And as a manager of a business, if I'm wanting to specifically understand how certain managerial decisions are impacting the business, I need that consistency in place and that consistency occurs through the chart of accounts. So a policy would be nobody makes a change to the chart of accounts without X procedure being followed so that we can all agree on how to change uh, or add or delete an account within the chart of accounts. Um, the policies need to address certainly manual journal entries and adjustments to the accounts or the counting records. Um, it should address how you handle your budgeting and your forecasting, how reimbursable expenses. So if somebody's traveling on behalf of the business, um, they should be able to look at the accounting manual and understand how they're going to be reimbursed for those expenses that they're incurring on behalf of the organization. Uh, so each of these, these different bullet points here help you understand uh, some of the policies or at least an example of the policies that should be addressed within the accounting manual. Uh, procedures are different from policies in that they give you a clear outline of the process to be followed uh, when a certain event is going to occur. So for example, back to our chart of accounts, it identifies who, who is authorized to make adjustments to the chart of accounts and the process that must be followed in order for those changes to be made. Um, recording transactions, we need to identify how we're going to verify the validity, the legality, the necessity, and the authorization of the transaction, uh, particularly if it's a situation where there's more people who are able to transact against the business, meaning you have you know, other credit cards or bank cards issued to staff members, family members, whatever it might be. So if you have more than one person who's controlling the ability or the access to those funds and able to transact against the business, we need a process for making sure that we can verify these, these each of these areas. Um, there needs to be a process for identifying uh, timekeeping, uh, leave requests and all that for payroll process purposes. Um, definitely the inventory valuation for farm businesses needs to be a robust and very comprehensive aspect if you keep farm inventory. Um, and I've provided a brief description for these remaining uh, areas within the procedure section. The accounting manual is a critically important document. Um, it does provide continuity and consistency and um, it certainly affects all aspects of the organization. It will touch every aspect of the organization. And in my opinion, it's just gonna help you manage the, the business more um, consistently and appropriately, particularly if you have staff beyond family members uh, or immediate family members that are gonna be helping you manage and grow the business. Um, that is all I have. I will at this time go ahead and open up the presentation for questions, uh, comments, concerns, gripes, complaints. No complaints here. Are there any other areas or any of the areas that I covered? Someone would like me to go into a little bit deeper detail. I try not to put you asleep. I know uh, this, this is not the most exciting content in the world to discuss, but uh, if, if I've done nothing more than just give you a few things to keep at the top of your mind as you're setting up your business and throughout your business, if you're like, hey, you know what? We're going to sell that tractor over there. Hopefully now you're able to look at that tractor and at least quickly make that determination of, look, there's more, there's more to just selling the tractor than the money we're gonna get for the tractor. We need to be able to think through how that's going to impact our taxes down the road. So at least knowing that you need to ask more questions about that type of a transaction uh, is, is for the benefit. I think hearing all this has made me realize that when I actually do get going. I'm definitely going to have to hire somebody to do all this for me. 
if if for nothing more tomorrow, um, if I can at least make that recommendation of hire someone at the onset to at least learn what you need to know to be able to ask the right questions, right? So the last thing you want as a business owner, especially if this is something you're looking at building as an asset to take care of your family in the long run, is you don't want a CPA or someone else to take advantage of that business. So if, if hiring someone and you do that under the mindset of eventually I want to take this back over myself because it's something I think I can do, but I am at least in the process learning the questions that I should be asking and the things that I should be monitoring of someone who's doing this work for me, you're at least able to better protect yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else have any other questions to add? Great. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for taking... Oh, Oga, did you have something? No, I was going to say that... Um... I don't really have any any questions to add. Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Kevin, for you know hosting and, and having this presentation. It was fairly informative. Uh, this will be recorded. So, and a lot of people have asked that it they get it after the fact. So uh, for those of us that weren't able to join us, I think they'll still be watching and getting a lot out of this. And then I will send the presentation slides to the participants um, after this, after this uh, finishes. So yeah, thanks again, everybody for joining us. And uh, thank you. Yeah, of course. And thank I hope you. you have a good rest of your day, everybody.